Go Good ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining for this week's UT Energy Symposium, which is on sustainability trends for the real estate industry. Before introducing the speaker, I would like to give you a heads up on what's coming up. Next week, we'll have a talk by Rayford Smith, who is with Google, and he will be talking to us on uh, technology trends in the digital industry and what's happening in terms of innovation. It's a much broader topic. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we are able to see my screen. Yes, you're back. Uh, and in particular, looking at digital infrastructure. Uh, the week after, we have Eric Danzinger, who is with the River, Riverbend Energy Group. He'll be talking to us on clean tech investing, uh, 1.02 energy transition investing today. And that's a really fascinating topic. So please join us for that. Basically, what has happened in the last 15 years or so. Uh, with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Akshay Rao, who is Senior Vice President of uh, Ancillary Services at Yardi System. Akshay joined Yardi in 2013 and oversees Yardi's Procure to Pay and Energy Business Units. During his tenure, Akshay has helped grow Yardi's Procure to Pay client base to more than 3,000 clients across all real estate verticals and several countries. Prior to joining, joining Yardi, he was manager in Bain and Company's tech and telecom practice. Uh, it's a great matter of pride for us that he is a Longhorn. He got his bachelor's in electric, electrical engineering from UT and then went on to get an MBA from the University of Michigan. Uh, more on a personal note, I have known Akshay for a few years and have always found him to be very thoughtful and purposeful. He has eyes on the big picture and is driven to address fundamental challenges of our times, including aspects of the energy system directly through his own work or through partnerships and collaboration, including generous support that he already provides for energy research at UT, and we are very grateful for that. So without any further ado, it's over to you, Akshay. All right. Thank you, Varun, and appreciate the introduction. I'm going to share my screen now and let me know if you guys can see this. Can you guys see... Awesome. Well, Bruno, really appreciate the introduction and, and just thrilled and, and honored to, to be speaking today. And, and I have to say the, the next two uh, discussions sound fantastic as well. I just wanted to go over a few topics of about 30 to 40 minutes worth of material. Uh, I wanted to start with a quick overview about Yardi, that may be a company that many people have not heard of. And so just to give a very brief overview on what we do, and then to dig into sustainability in real estate. Um, we are a real estate software company. Uh, all of our clients uh, are either owners or managers uh, of real estate. And uh, just talk through some of the things that we're seeing from a sustainability perspective. And then go into some of the stakeholders. Who is driving the changes and who is driving some of this change that, that is really required in the real estate industry? And then I just wanted to lay out an approach that Yardi is putting out there just at a high level, uh, the potential approach at, at tackling some of these big problems. Uh, and I'll just make one comment. If there's any questions, uh, you know, Varun or Kerry, happy to, to answer them as we go along. We'd love to make this as uh, uh, kind of interactive as possible. So we'll defer to you on that. I'll just start with uh, an overview of, of Yardi Systems. Uh, we were founded in 1984 by Anand Yardi. Uh, we're based out of Santa Barbara, California. Anand is still the, uh, the CEO. He continues to manage uh, the day-to-day. Uh, we have 7,700 employees worldwide across 45 offices. Of course, for the past 19 months, uh, the vast, vast majority of us have been working from home. Uh, we do have a few essential areas where we take in checks and invoices uh, in New York and in Austin. I'm in our Austin office uh, and in Santa Barbara, but uh, I would say 7,600 out of the 7,700 employees have been working remotely as many, as many of you likely have been. Uh, we have done over a billion dollars in revenue uh, in 2019. We'll be around $1.5 billion in revenue in 2020. Uh, and so we're, we're the largest uh, real estate software company in the world. There are other companies that do similar types of things. And our client base is about 10,000 clients. And what that means is they could be investors of real estate, owners uh, in terms of uh, actually owning the space. Uh, and then management, so managing the spaces as well. So we do touch a lot of different aspects of the real estate industry. About 12 billion square feet of commercial space, so that would be office buildings, retail, uh, industrial space, do use our software platforms uh, to manage their spaces, and about 12 million 
residential units. So the joke I make to people when they interview is if you live in an apartment complex in the United States of America, there's about a 50% chance, 50% chance that if you pay rent online or that you even uh, cut a check and, and drop it off, that that payment is going through our systems. Or if you have a maintenance request, that that's, that maintenance request is going through our systems to, to the uh, appropriate technician who will then come over and fix whatever it is you're having issues with. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we do. Just to give you perspective, we are privately held. Uh, we do not have any outside investors. We're not a publicly traded company. Uh, we were named uh, to the Forbes Cloud 100 for the last four or five years. Um, those are all pre-IPO or privately held uh, cloud companies. Um, the last three years, we've been an Energy Star uh, Partner of the Year. Uh, we take great pride in this. We do a lot of work with the Energy Star group, uh, and we're starting to work with other groups. I'll touch on that in just a moment. Uh, and then, of course, thrilled and honored from an employee's perspective to have been named a top place to work for large companies. Uh, and also Anant has been named uh, a top CEO for three of the last four years by Glassdoor. So just kind of giving you a sense, uh, our culture is uh, based on uh, a motto that has been around uh, since the company was founded almost 40 years ago, uh, to take care of our clients, take care of our employees, take care of our communities, and to stay focused and grow. So that's, that's the, the Yardi story. So with that, let me jump in. Uh, and just kind of start talking about the case for sustainability in real estate. And I think that there's this intuition that most people have that real estate is a, a large source of consumption, energy consumption, but also emissions. Uh, and, I, and I think people sometimes struggle to put that into words. And so what I've done here is just trying to give a summary of, of the view from a very high level. Uh, in the United States, it's the fourth leading cause of emissions, so the, the built environment. So that is the office buildings that we go to, the campuses that um, we study at, the, the, where we live and, and where we shop. 15% uh, of CO2 emissions in the United States uh, from real estate. Uh, transportation, the actual generation of, of uh, energy and manufacturing, you know, steel, aluminum, manufacturing of goods, uh, all are the, the top three in real estate comes down before. In terms of electrical use uh, in the U.S., Vern, is there a question? Uh, yeah, actually, you know, because you wanted to make this conversational. Yeah, yeah. The the generation part, Akshay. Yeah. I think a lot of that actually also is generated to send to the building. Yes. And yes. when you so this is not accounting for that, but if you account for that, I think it goes up as high as thirty-five to forty percent. It, so it becomes so much more important if you look at that. That, I think that's an exact, exactly right point where you have this kind of reciprocity, which is the buildings require generation, the generation <laughs> requires, uh, you know, emits. And so it becomes, so if you add this up and I'll get to this in a bit, but if you also add up the amount of energy intensity to build and construct the buildings, you're actually talking about potentially up to 45 to 50% of total uh, emissions uh, worldwide. Uh, so it's a huge thing. Uh, and that, that's exactly the, a great point. And, and if you look at that, that next point is 35% of electrical use in the US is used by the built environment. So when I say built environment, those are buildings that are already standing and that's where you get this kind of feedback mechanism. The, the thing that is important to understand is this is an energy, the next number, this 30% number is an energy star number. They estimate the average commercial building and that commercial building could be a mall, it could be an office place, it could be an industrial warehouse wastes 30% of its consumption. So if you just think about that, that, you know, it's one of the largest, uh, you know, uh, cons consumers in the, the U.S. Uh, economy and across the world, but it's also, there's a dramatic amount that's being wasted. And so much of this has to do with just HVAC, running the ACs. And so if you think about it from that perspective, there's a huge opportunity. And then from a cost perspective, if you're an owner uh, or if you're a tenant, uh, we're starting to see those uh, rates increase pretty dramatically. And you're starting to see that even now, natural gas pricing is spiking. This is gonna have an operational impact on the real estate industry. So there's a lot of reasons uh, why you would want a more sustainable portfolio. But you know, I, you know, I don't wanna be overly uh, critical of, of, of our industry. And this is an industry that I take great pride in and, and am a part of, but the pandemic over the past 19 months you would have expected that consumption would have uh, would have 
lower dramatically just because there weren't people in, 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 uh, in the office spaces. There weren't people necessarily going out to the malls. It, it was a much more muted sense of going into uh, shared space. And we haven't seen a big drop in consumption uh, in terms of the early look at what happened in 2020 and early 2021. So we do have a long way to go, but I think that we're starting to make progress on where we need to go. So I just wanna talk a bit about the stakeholders who are gonna be driving this. There's a lot of complexity in terms of driving consumption down. And some of that complexity is around, well, who has the final bill? Who pays for the final electric bill uh, or the gas bill or the trash bill? Uh, and so you have to kind of uh, make sure that all stakeholders are on the same page. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these in detail, but let me just give you, in my, from my perspective, the three uh, predominant stakeholders. The first are the investors the people who are actually uh, cutting the checks or making the payments to buy these portfolios, to buy these assets. Uh, they're very, very large investors in many ways. Uh, some of them are retirement funds, uh, you know, institutional banks. There, there's a lot of people that are now investing in real estate and those investors are placing much more importance on ESG factors. So as they kind of look at what they're investing in, they're making sure that they're following these environmental, social and governance factors within that portfolio. You also have the tenants and customers and employees of the company. So if you think about an office building like the one I'm in right now, we share this office space. We have about 25,000 square feet. We're up on Oak Knoll and, and Research Boulevard. Visa has uh, the, uh, the majority of this space and we've got uh, you know, the first floor, they've got the other three floors. But if you look at both Visa and Yardi, we now have sustainability goals and we want to make sure that we are putting our employees in the right in, in the right types of places and that, that our partners uh, have, have sustainability as top of mind. So this is becoming more and more important for tenants. And then finally, it's policy. So you start seeing local and federal regulation. Uh, we're starting to see more and more regulation at the local level. New York, Los Angeles just launched something. Boston just launched uh, San Francisco. So you're seeing this, but um, I'll get to a map in a bit, but it's not just the coastal cities. There's lots of cities across America that are now that are now looking at regulation on what emissions are expected from from buildings, specifically large buildings, uh, and federal re regulation. This is becoming a, a hot topic as well, especially as you start looking at the infrastructure bill uh, and other things that the Biden administration are, are talking about. So, I've kind of put these three stakeholders as, as the as the predominant stakeholders that are going to help drive change. And I'll just talk very briefly about tenants. That is an important piece. The tenants have to be a part of this. And I'll get into a little bit more detail, but the thing to understand is the building that I'm in right now, the owner does not pay the final electric bill. They, they typically don't pay that. It's gonna be the tenants that pay that either through the lease um, that we sign or we're getting the uh, bill in our name. So we have to make sure that tenants and owners and the, the managers, the people who manage the buildings, are all on the same page. And I think that's starting to happen. Just to give you a perspective on investors, uh, I've shown a chart here on the right. Uh, you may have heard of Gresby or Gresb. It's, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Um, but Gresby is effectively becoming the de facto standard for ESG coverage in real estate. And in, the, in, in 2020, despite the pandemic, you see this massive uh, rise in terms of the number of investors who are participating in Gresby. And what that means is that they are submitting some deep information on their assets, the assets that they own uh, to Gresby for scoring. So similar to Energy Star scoring, Gresby also does scoring. Uh, they're about to cross $5 trillion of assets under management that are now participating in Gresby. Uh, and it's, a, it's become a huge thing in the, in the uh, industry you know, as a, as a company who provides solutions, we're being told, this is where we want to go. We want to make sure that we have Gresby coverage and our roadmaps are being driven by this. Our competitors' roadmaps are being driven by this. So I think it's a very healthy thing. And it's great that Gresby is becoming this de facto standard because now there's a way to compare assets and portfolios uh, in a like manner, but also it allows for more standard data gathering and, and, uh, and pushing data appropriately to Gresby for the scoring. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is there's a thing called the Net Zero Owner Alliance. So this is more international than U.S., but about 45 of the world's largest owners internationally have committed to zero net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. So when you look at this and you kind of take the larger view of things, 
you start to see a perspective where investors, the people who are making the decisions on where the money will go, where the funding goes, are starting to really uh, push sustainability as one of their driving topics and decision-making points. Akshay, I, if I can ask you two quick questions. Can you tell us a little bit about the organization of Gresby? Is it a nonprofit, for-profit? How is it uh, organized? It's a nonprofit in Europe. I believe they're based out of the Netherlands. And uh, they effectively, you know, Gresby actually started uh, predominantly for infrastructure and real estate, just as a way to start sharing what is the energy intensity and what are the things that you're doing to ensure that you're becoming more efficient uh, from an emissions perspective, but also from uh, a governance perspective as well. Uh, it, so what they do is they've got a very, very deep uh, set of requirements for you to submit and it's asset by asset. Uh, so you may be doing something in a, in a building or an asset uh, in California that may be different than what you're doing in Texas. And there may be various reasons for that, but you actually put, you submit based on each asset. Uh, mm -hmm. And you submit based on uh, three different things. Uh, there's kind of the performance aspect, which is what is your actual emissions, your, your GHG emissions? What, uh, what does your consumption look like? There's the development aspect, which is what are you doing to improve that? So are you potentially doing LED retrofits in the building? Or are you looking at solar on the rooftop? And then there's the governance, which is who are making these decisions and what are the criteria that you're making decisions on? Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it's become this very, very... Uh, important pivot point for portfolio managers and owners to really say, this is what we're doing across our entire portfolio, regardless of where it is. And you can see in the chart, Europe is a huge part of this. Mm -hmm. So this is that, that um, dark yeah. green, the 610 line. Yeah, the and US once, is growing. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Mark. Once you submit it, what do you get? Do you get a certification or what? You get scores back. And uh, these scores generally will be uh, shown to the investors. So if you think about how real estate is purchased, there's very few individuals who can go buy a class A office building or a portfolio of class A office buildings. So what you have is you have groups of investors, limited partners and general partners. Uh, and the general partners will kind of find the deals. The limited partners will provide a lot of the funding. And they're the ones who are, so if you can imagine Goldman Sachs potentially being the limited partner or JP Morgan Chase being a limited partner, they're going to want to know that their portfolio has an appropriate sustainability plan. And the way they know that is using Gresby scores. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how this feeds upon itself, which is you want that standard and there's a lot of designations. Lead is a designation that you can get. You can get Energy Star, of course. So the two that are becoming the most predominant, uh, Energy Star in the US and then Gresby internationally. And those scores that you receive, uh, you can show trends of your portfolio with your scores either increasing or decreasing. Mm -hmm. and, and the investor class is now starting to really look at that. So a Thank you, Akshay. A quick second one, the Net Zero Owner Alliance goals. Are the, are the net zero goals scope one, scope two, or yep. do they include scope three? Um, so in terms of, well, scope one, scope two, I may not know where you're headed with that. And, and essentially, is it just the operations of the buildings or is it also, you know, what's happening in the supply chain and eventually, you know, depending on in what types of customers, is it yeah. all inclusive or just focusing on the operations? Right now, it is, I believe, just scope one is what they're planning and not looking at the supply chain. Uh, what I will say a little bit broader than just the operations of the buildings, which I'll get into in just a bit, is uh, there's an entire group for, I think it's called Design 2030, that is about the construction of the building. So less about the supply chain once the building is, is actually built and more about what are we doing from an intensity perspective while building the structures. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thank you, Akshay. Yeah. Actually, I did have one maybe follow-up question that's with Carrie. Uh, I think you alluded to it and you mentioned to it on your previous slides is getting um, the owners of a building and the tenants aligned on some of these principles. And I guess Gresby perhaps helps in that. Is there anything else you can say about the difficulties of getting incentives aligned between people, you know, living in or operating in a building and, yeah. and the people who uh, own it? Yeah. yeah, this is the, I think this is the actual, the most practical consideration for the real estate industry. And that kind of gets into how do you align? So if you know the investors want to have a portfolio that is sustainable and that is showing a path to sustainability, how do you align the people that are actually in the building, the tenants or the customers in, the, in this case, 
Uh, and I think that's where we're starting to see a lot of change as well, Carrie. And it's, it's harder to do because it's so lease specific. And I, I think it's a good lead into this. A lot of times you have leases and, and this is gonna get into a little bit of a level of detail. So keep me honest if I'm going too deep, too deep. But you have leases where the majority of the, uh, the cost for whether it's electricity, whether it's gas or trash is being borne by the tenant. Or in some cases you have leases, and this is typical in the industrial world, you know, for warehousing. Uh, it's completely borne by the tenant. And in fact, the bill is in the tenant's name. And so the owner on some level is gonna be dinged if there are re local regulations, but it's the tenant that's actually driving it. And so there's this, there's this thing where we have to kind of get past this and we're starting to. The specific thing that I'll bring up as a way to get around this is called green leasing. And there are these green leases where the owners and the tenants can come together and say, look, we're gonna share data. We're gonna both be you know, transparent about what our expectations are. And in order for us to get things like Energy Star scoring and Gresby scoring, we need to make sure that we're sharing data that the tenant is allowing the owner uh, data to what their consumption is, what their demand is, when that demand happens, whether it's off peak, on peak, things like that. So those green leases are becoming more and more important. And we're working with uh, a couple of nonprofits, IMT, the Institute for Market Transformation, is one who also, Varun, you, you know, uh, IMT, they're working on making green leasing more standard across the industry. So I think, Carrie, to that point, those are the types of very specific things that we need to bring into the industry to kind of get that, uh, the tenant and the owners on the same page. And, and just, to, you know, on the screen here, there's a few examples. I just put examples of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, they all have very, very deep and detailed expectations for themselves uh, as it relates to carbon neutrality. And, and Varun, to your point, this goes well beyond just where they're working, but their real estate portfolio, and they have millions of square feet each of these uh, companies amongst the, the thousands of other companies that, that, have, um, that have space. They're very clear that they're not only getting to net zero, but you can see in this bottom chart from Microsoft, their intention is to get carbon negative by 2030. Uh, and I think because of these types of things, and this includes supply chain, this includes manufacturing, uh, you're gonna start to see expectations and we're, our clients are already seeing this where their largest uh, tenants are saying, look, what is your sustainability plan for, for the, the space that we are leasing from you? Uh, at Yardi, we do this with our, um, with, with our partners. Um, we have buildings that we own in, our, uh, in uh, our headquarters in Santa Barbara, and we manage those. Our goal is to be net zero by 2030 for those, but we're also working with partners where we lease uh, space, and we have about a million square feet across our 45 offices. Uh, these companies have hundreds of millions of square feet that they're either using for, uh, for, their, for offices or for warehousing. So I think we're, we're on the right page and we're getting in the right direction for tenants and owners uh, to get aligned on this because all of this is converging into sustainability is no longer a nice to have. It's starting to become a, uh, a table stakes in terms of who's gonna partner with whom. And the last piece I just wanted to touch upon briefly is policy making. We're seeing a large scale shift, especially at the local level uh, to start putting goals in place. And these goals in place are similar to what you're seeing from Energy Star and Gre Gresby, which is we wanna see the data. We wanna see the data of what the buildings are emitting and what the buildings are consuming on an annual basis. And just to give you a, a perspective, a lot of this is focused on large buildings, generally 100,000 square feet, give or take, or more. Those large buildings, what we'll call, let's just say 100,000 square feet or more, they are 5% of the built environment in the United States but they make up 50% of the emissions. So 5% of the buildings in the United States, the large buildings make up half of the emissions. The other 95%, which are generally smaller buildings, maybe medical office type of buildings, um, you know, smaller office buildings make up the other 50%. So where the cities have really started is on the large buildings. That's where they're really focused on. And if you look at the, the amount of cities, obviously we always hear about New York, and Boston, and DC and San Francisco and LA, um, but over 450 cities have all stated, stated goals for supporting emissions reductions. So this is happening across a lot of major cities. Uh, Austin is a city, Georgetown, directly north of us. Uh, you know, the mayor of Georgetown 
uh, is, is saying that they want to be completely green over the next decade. So there, there's a lot of this happening uh, across the United States. And New York, Boston, and D.C. have joined a few other cities, St. Louis, the, uh, and then also a couple of states. I think Puerto Rico and Washington State uh, are two of the larger jurisdictions that have also joined this, which is called the Building Performance Standard. And all this is right now is it, it's just a, a handful of these jurisdictions. But what they're saying is we want to get on a path to net zero over the next 30 years. And we want to share data to show how these cities are doing. And so they're rewriting a lot of their local legislation around these building performance standards. And if you're interested in that, if you go to imt.org, they have information on that. So it's a really interesting thing that's happening, which is cities are saying we want access to the data. We want to make sure that we're we are comparing again like for like within the city and then starting to hold owners and tenants accountable for uh, the consumption and the emissions within those buildings and the other thing i'll just say is if you look at the biden administration their initial infrastructure bill which was the american jobs act that was the three trillion dollar bill it had over 200 million dollars it was about 215 million dollars i believe specifically for retrofitting homes and buildings so you're starting to get that local uh, interest and you're also starting to get that federal interest and where that will go is unclear, but there is now a lot more policy momentum going in this direction. And one of the things we tell our clients is if you don't have a standard way of looking at your portfolio and determining uh, consumption and emissions, then the local jurisdictions where your portfolio resides, which could be very different parts of the United States or across the world, will start to dictate that to you. And so what we're, we're suggesting to clients is start to create a set of standards. And this is what a lot of um, the industry is saying is create a set of standards across a portfolio that makes sense and that is informed by both policy and what's realistic. Let me pause there. I think there are maybe a couple more questions that have come in. I think one of the questions is, I guess, relates to the Gresby. Yep. And that was about when you submit all of that, the score that you get back is that asset specific, or is it you know all assets combined for for one entity? It's a, it's a very good uh, question. Generally, the scoring is asset specific, but then investors will look at their whole portfolio and get a sense of all of the assets in their portfolio, what those scores look like. There's two things. So I'd say Energy Star scoring and Gresby scoring is very much asset specific, and it's really in order to see trends of that asset or of a portfolio. If you take, let's say a 10 building portfolio, you then have other things called lead. Uh, and there are a few others. Um, IRM has one as well, which are like stamps, which you can put on the building to say we're a lead platinum building. Those are two different ways of looking at it. When you do the thing like lead platinum, you're basically suggesting to people coming into that building, whether it's employees, tenants, or customers, that this building is a green building or is a high performing building you would assume that there's overlap that a, a lead platinum building would also have a high Grosby score and energy star score, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and because we are on policy, a related question on policy, have you seen, uh, Akshay, that at the country level or for policymaking purposes, do you see any movement towards including things like Grosby or, or making use of it, depending on that as a signal, if you will, as a state of you know, buildings in certain sectors? Well, I'll say this, Energy Star is the EPA, right? So that's, you know, that, that is a governmental agency and they've done an incredible job. I think this has been a multi-decade long thing. Uh, Europe certainly is, you know, less familiar, of course, but Europe is now certainly very much kind of taking a top-down approach, a uh, country level approach and their ministries of energy, uh, energy are doing this. Uh, I think in the US, it's always gonna be a mix. The EPA and Energy Star is a standard way of looking at buildings in terms of consumption. Uh, but the local, uh, the, the, the local jurisdictions, so let's just say the city of New York, they will believe, and I think rightfully so, that their requirements are different than another city, maybe in Texas. Uh, and so they're going to want to have specific uh, uh, you know, ways of approaching this that are specific to the city and specific to the people in the city. Uh, one, one thing I will say, I, I don't know if we'll ever get to a federal standard, but I think through Energy Star, uh, we're starting to get to a, a federal way of at least scoring the buildings and looking at trends across uh, across the country. But I think it's going to really be local regulations that drive mm -hmm. um, specific assets within that locate, locality. 
Great, thank you, Akshay. And uh, I'll remind the audience to type in their questions in the Q and A box. Let me ask a follow on to Akshay uh, yep. on that, in the sense of, do you see a trend, or is it good or bad if there are many uh, performance standards, uh, not even just government, but uh, you know, separate organizations, whether they're nonprofit or or what have you, uh, for ESG in general, but for buildings specifically as well, is it you know, are you gonna is somebody gonna be looking at getting ten different you know scorings yeah. and then who every anybody who's interested has to deal with that, or do you think it's gonna have to consolidate? I think so. One, it would be great if there was a standard just across the entire world. It would be amazing. I, I don't know if we'll ever get there. We do have a lot, and and each you know we frankly we we partner with a lot of the different groups and. And they all have, I think, very thoughtful uh, requirements and ways of going about it. But I do think, at least in the U.S., let me just talk in the U.S. because that's really where we are focused, or I'm focused, I should say. I am seeing two specific uh, you know, standards kind of becoming the mainstream standard. Energy Star has been for a while. Uh, and they, are, they have done an incredible job. Uh, I, I forget exactly how many buildings have Energy Star scores, but it is a very large number of buildings in the United States, which means it's become the de facto standard. And that data is being used in very, very interesting ways. One, it's being used to show your tenants uh, or your investors that, hey, this Energy Star score goes up. We personally take a lot of pride in our the buildings that we own having high Energy Star scores. That's something that we take pride in. So even Inside of the organizations, it's, uh, it, it can drive positive behavior. And the second, which is really for the investors, is Gresby. I do think that has become the de facto standard over time because so many of the large investors are asking for Gresby scoring. Now, for consumers and for those of us walking into, let's say you walk into a store, how will you know if that's a part? It's a little bit different there, and I think it's a little more difficult. If you, if you do kind of pay attention when you walk into like a class A office building, you'll see some, you know, typically like a lead, a lead sticker on the, the entryway. Um, there's a lot of pride that comes with that, um, but it's not something that the consumers, it's not top of mind for consumers just yet. I think what is becoming top of mind for consumers is just knowing that the corporations that they either work for or that they are purchasing from are, are keeping this in mind. And I think that's going to become, that's, it's very hard to standardize that. Right. If you go look at how each company is doing it, it's a little bit different. But I do think in real estate, Energy Star has been standardized and Gresby is quickly becoming the standard. And then for in buildings, those stamps of approval, I think LEED and IRAM are two of the most, uh, the most used uh, approvals. Great. Thank you. Sure. And Sabrina, I hope I answered the question. Let me know if not. Um, but so if I just kind of uh, take this to, well, what does this mean? So, you know, I think we know sustainability, there's a case to be made for sustainability in the real estate industry. And again, I'll just say, I think on some level, the real estate industry has been able to duck a little bit of the criticism that the transportation energy or the manufacturing uh, or even the generation industries have, have taken over the past decade. I think there's now much more focus on this in the real estate industry. And, and like I said, coming from investors, coming from tenants, uh, and then now some policy changes that are happening. So what does this mean? So how do we kind of make progress on this? And, and I think it's gonna take a holistic approach. So I don't think you can just say, well, you have to, you have to cut demand and consumption to a point where you know, you're, you're net zero. I think there's gonna be a few different aspects to this. And the first is that built environment. We do need to re reduce that kind of operational carbon uh, waste. Again, I'll go back to if, if we believe that, you know, the average commercial building is wasting 30% of its consumption, let's tackle that first, right? And I'll get into a little bit of some of the solutions that, that, um, that you can look at for that. The second, which I actually don't think gets enough of a conversation, but it is now starting to get this, especially as you look at the venture capital money that's going into real estate, um, a lot of it is going on new construction. So if you think about over the next 30 years, uh, they're talking about basically a new New York being built like every 30 to 50 days, give or take. I mean, that's how much construction is happening across the world. 
And maybe the pandemic will lower that a little bit, uh, but there's still a dramatic amount of construction. And I just want to reiterate that when you have a building and if you've built that building, the emissions from the building of that, the construction of that building make up almost half of the total emissions over the lifetime of that asset. So just, you know, once again, the actual construction of these, of these assets is about half of the, the lifetime of emissions. So we've got to get better at that embodied carbon, meaning how much did it take to actually build? And you can imagine steel, aluminum, all of those things, the trucks that are driving, all those things that happen, that is, those are emissions and that is, that is consumption. And then the final thing is, I think the real estate industry is uniquely capable of actually generating uh, clean energy. And this is starting to happen. Uh, you know, the actual generation of energy and, and you start to look at the grid that are using some of these more distributed ways of, of, of uh, generation. Real estate is a lot of that, whether it's the roof on your house or the roof on a massive Amazon warehouse that they may be leasing from, from someone. So that's, that's one piece. And then the second piece, which I actually don't think people talk about enough, is there are a lot of large markets in the United States that, uh, that are not regulated. So you actually have a deregulated market. You can sell uh, as a third party, you don't have to use the, uh, you know, the kind of your standard utility. The owners do have the power to start purchasing clean energy and to say, we want our energy coming from clean sources. And what that will do is then it will then require, and this is Varun to your point, which is it's this feedback loop where that will now require more generation to be clean. And that investment naturally gets to uh, more renewables. And so I think these are the three ways, and this is just, our suggestion is, you know, Yardi's suggestion. It's not suggesting this only ways, but these, we think these are the three big uh, um, kind of pillars that we can start to make a, a big impact on sustainability in, in the real estate industry. I'm just gonna go through a couple of things on each of these. One, one item, so starting with the operational, uh, you know, reducing the operational carbon for the built environment. So these are buildings that, are, that are, have already been built that are likely wasting uh, a material amount of their consumption. I'll say this, the technology is already there. Like it's already there to, to help solve for this. And it's in, from increasing levels of you know, uh, effort and time to money. So it's really just about what the owner and, and what the managers are, are able to and willing to implement. Uh, starting from really just kind of old school invoice processing, taking those utility bills. There is so much data on those utility bills that a lot of times, uh, you know, real estate clients are worried about shutoffs. They don't want the lights to turn off in the building. And so they just pay the invoice without looking at the detail, without doing the data analytics on that detail and mining of that data. Uh, there's very deep consumption, time of use, all that type of stuff that's on these invoices. So just getting that data, and you can imagine, that can give you a solid trend analysis of what's happening at an asset or within a portfolio. And by the way, all the data that comes from this is what ends up getting submitted to Energy Star and Gresby. So this is the data that's getting submitted. So if you have a way of capturing that data and analyzing that data and making decisions, they don't have to be groundbreaking decisions, just simple decisions, iterative decisions, it's very powerful. And then using that data on the things that we've been talking about, energy benchmarking, Gresby and Energy Star have done an amazing job building standard APIs so companies like Yardi can submit information to the to the two uh, to those two organizations in a very quick way on behalf of our clients, or our clients can do that as well. So that's a huge thing, and that's that scoring piece. And then you start moving into some of the more IoT, and I think this gets you know these last three real time metering things like fault detection and building optimization get a lot of um, press coverage. Uh, real time metering is very what I'll call light touch IoT. Uh, this is where you can literally just kind of put a uh, piece of hardware on the, the pulse interface box that the utility has, and you can get the real-time meter reads. So you can see the demand profile of a building in real time. And it's almost like a Fitbit or an Apple watch for the building. What is it doing at specific times of day? And I'll show just a bit on how we used it at our headquarters uh, to reduce our, our energy consumption. And then the final thing is fault detection. A lot of your class A buildings have building management systems. How do you plug in? and just kind of see where you have HVAC issues, dirty filters, which can uh, reduce efficiency, where you actually may have issues in the air handler unit, proactively getting uh, ahead of these before the HVAC system kind of overworks itself or uh, actually starts to fail. And the final thing is building optimization. You know, 
AI managed HVAC settings to where it is, it is resetting things based on how many people are in the building, all those types of things. Uh, you're starting to see that more and more, but I think what we're finding is a lot of the upfront cost there is deterring owners and they're really focused on starting with, let's get the data we have access to from the invoices and let's start benchmarking ourselves and seeing if we can reduce uh, energy intensity in our portfolio. So, so a couple of questions actually at this point. Yep. One is at the very beginning, you mentioned that during COVID, one would have expected, given you know that buildings were probably you know being used differently and interacted with differently to yep. for energy use and consumption and emissions there are to fall, but but that didn't happen. Given that you just laid out these you know five you know major tools, if you will, that are available and are increasingly permeating, why? What were the reasons that we did not see what we had expected or would have anticipated? So the first is cost. Um, you know, fundamentally, people view real estate and especially these large buildings as an asset that you will own for years. And I think a lot of that comes from our personal experience of maybe a 30 year home mortgage. So there's this assumption that, cool, I can spend X hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on the size of the building or maybe a million dollars or whatever it may be on you know, getting a more efficient HVAC system and then putting in an AI type of kind of HVAC management software. The problem with that kind of line of thinking is a lot of these buildings are actually held for five to seven years. They're not held for 20 to 30 years. The majority of them are not actually, especially now. Uh, they're held for five to seven years in a fund. And when you start talking about, even if you're buying a, let's just say a hundred million dollar building and you're wanting to show returns to your investors, a $500,000 CapEx project is not something you're necessarily interested in doing. But what you are interested in doing is taking data that's already available to you, which is coming from those invoices, working with your tenants on getting their, their invoices so that you can actually just start to get access to that data. So that's, that's the biggest thing in my mind is that cost and then that return. Typically what you find on, from a return perspective is it happens within 18 to 36 months. It's not like it takes five years, but at that point, the owner has said, you know, I may be in the middle of trying to sell it at that point, and am I going to actually even get the benefits of it? So what, what a lot of the industry has been doing is, is saying, can you actually empirically show an increase in the value of the asset if you have done those types of things? And there's some anecdotal evidence, I wouldn't say it's empirical right now, that there is a bit of a lift on the value of the asset. But really, Varun, I think it's been cost and just the time to get that return. And that's where something like light IoT, this metering, where really instead of a full-on AI type of thing, which is great from a technical perspective, but this idea of like a Fitbit, you can start to make very incremental changes that can have dramatic effects on, on the building. And that actually costs just in the hundreds or the thousands of dollars. You're talking about one to $2,000 to kind of get going. And, and owners are like, that's fine. That sounds great. Go do that. And then let's just see what we can do and incrementally build up to those. Great, thank you. And I have one more question. I'll come back yeah. to that. And there was a, an audience audience question on co cost, but you already got to that. So, great. Um, and then I do see Mark made a comment: sustainability accounting standards board. Yes. So a lot of that is used in things like Gresby will look at that. There's also there's a I believe it's called the scientific uh, method of uh, sustainability. There's a lot of these boards that give standards that are used by by these nonprofits and by by our clients and, and by us as well. So that is that is a good point. Um, I just wanted to give a very uh, high level view, and this is a bit of an eye chart on real time metering. So this kind of middle light IoT, uh, we did this on our headquarters and this is this is our headquarters. This is our demand profile um, for one of our buildings on our headquarter campus. And it's midnight to midnight. So if you take kind of the far left of each chart to the far right, that's 15 minute intervals from, from 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. And it's just showing you what the max demand at every, any 15 minute interval is in terms of kilowatts. And what this shows you, if you look at January, 2019, you know, we were starting our HVAC systems at like 3 a.m. And you know, by just kind of getting that Fitbit onto the building, we started to realize like, why are we starting at 3 or 4 a.m.? And what came to, you know, be kind of recognized as we have a couple of people coming into our warehouse at, you know, 4.30 or 5 a.m. to, you know, whatever, to get packages or whatever it may be. 
And just that knowledge allowed us to make a couple of changes. And so if you just take it to the next month, we started the HVAC system more like 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. for when the majority of the employees were coming in. And you can see how it's a cleaner start. And then you get to that peak, but the peak is about the same as January, 2019. And then you, and then you start to wind down the HVAC around 6 p.m., 7 p.m. ish, right? So same time we were doing before. Once we did that, we kind of said, okay, how do we reduce the max demand when everyone is in the building? Uh, and what we found is that we were starting to cool uh, the building heavily at around 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And we we're just keeping it that way, regardless of what the temperature was. And so we just took one level of uh, decision-making, which is only do it if the temperature is above or below a certain um, uh, temperature, otherwise just kind of keep it as is. And this is where we got 20% reduction uh, in our in our consumption and emissions and in spend as well. And this is what kind of when you tie this back to you know, the average commercial building is wasting 30%, this easily shows you that that could be true. And it probably is true. And this is where I think, Rune, we're starting to see a lot of clients say, I would love this data. Similar to if you're just tracking your steps, you tend to take more steps. And so this is becoming kind of the inverse of that, where if you're just tracking the building steps of the demand, you'll likely start to take fewer steps and actually start to, to, to manage it just a bit more closely. And it can have dramatic impacts on the, uh, on the actual consumption. I'll close up with a couple more slides. Just wanna be cognizant of time, got about 10 minutes. Um, you know, new construction, this is a piece I'm frankly new to as well uh, in terms of just kind of getting a sense of it. But there is a lot of concern and opportunity on new construction. It, Fundamentally, it just has to become more sustainable. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fact is, you know, over the past few years, the assumptions have been that the total building areas on the far left-hand side is going to double by 2050 or 2060, depending on who you look at. And this is the Architecture 2030 group. Uh, this is folks like Gensler and others who are designing and, and helping construct the new buildings. They're starting to really look at this uh, as something that they need to be aware of. And, you know, Rune, to your earlier point, we talk about the feedback loop of building operations requiring more generation, which you know it kind of has this uh, you know modulate or this bigger effect. The building aspect, the construction aspect, has a dramatic effect. I mean, concrete, steel, aluminum, and you can imagine concrete and steel. Much of the concrete and steel that is produced is to go to new construction, uh, and so this is a huge, huge thing where we have got to have better processes for constructing. Uh, and, and if you look at architecture 2030, they basically have this three-step plan, which is reuse, try to renovate the existing buildings, make the envelopes of the buildings uh, more sustainable. So don't allow so much air to come in. Uh, you know, make sure that they're, they're uh, more sound buildings. Use, recyc use recycled materials where you can. Uh, I saw a company just a couple of years ago uh, that was taking uh, recycled materials and actually building cinder blocks out of that. So those types of things and try to design for deconstruction where if you're going to, uh, if you're going to destruct a building, do it in a way that allows you to reuse a lot of those materials. And then reducing the uh, amount of materials that are being used and then sequestering. So actually understand that you are going to be emitting carbon and look for ways to sequester. The same things that we're asking uh, our, our generating plants to do as well. So this is really where we see it going. Uh, it's a bit newer to me, but there's a lot of folks really working on this from a new construction perspective. And it's as important as making sure that the current built environment is operating effectively as well. And then the final thing, I think this is a huge opportunity for our industry as a whole, which is gen generation and purchasing. Uh, the picture on the left-hand side is an Amazon warehouse that they lease from a company, Prologis. Prologis is a publicly traded REIT. You can go look them up. They're one of the largest REITs in the world. Uh, they're the largest owner uh, of industrial space. Amazon is obviously a very large client of theirs. There is a ton of rooftop solar specifically in this market. Uh, and this is actually one of the highest growth asset classes. If you can imagine, it makes sense. Warehousing is becoming more and more important, that last mile. Um, so industrial is a great asset to be in, in in real estate. And it's also a great asset for generation. So a lot of these industrial clients are saying, you know, we want to make sure that we're generating and there's, there's return involved for them. What they're doing is saying to the, their tenants, look, we're going to bill you. So the, the utility bill will be in our name. 
but we're going to bill you and we're going to generate. And so they're getting net metering credits from the solar and the tenant isn't paying any more than they would have paid to the utility. But now the, the, the REITs that own these assets are actually generating returns, even in addition to lease and other more traditional revenue sources. So there's a lot that's happening. I've just put a couple of data points on Prologis. Um, they've done over 250 megawatts of generation. Uh, and they're, the, they're, I think, the third largest uh, solar capacity company in the U.S. based on 2019. So I, what I will say is I think this is going to be a trend that you'll see, especially on the industrial side. Uh, this is going to become more and more of a trend. And you can start to see it potentially on office buildings as well, where office buildings are looking at generation. And then we touched on a little earlier, but purchasing. In deregulated markets, these owners are very large. Uh, they have a lot of purchasing power. And so you're starting to see them combine to say, how do we get, how do we leverage some of that power uh, to reduce our costs, but also reduce uh, consumption and to require renewable generation from, from utilities. So that's kind of the spiel. Uh, and uh, you know, let me just close up by saying, I think the case for sustainability is clear in real estate. I think in a way we've flown under the radar a bit. It's now time for our industry to make strides. And I think a bit more of a, uh, a, you know, a light shining on us is a good thing. And, and in my mind, the investors, the tenants, and the, the policymakers are all going to drive the industry forward with you know, collaboration with the owners and the managers. And I think that collaboration is happening. Uh, and I'll also say that we, we know what the solutions are. Uh, is specifically on reducing uh, consumption in the built environment, as well as generation and, and purchasing. I think construction is starting to get there. So now we just have to execute. And I think over the next decade, you'll see that execution. Uh, and, and it's important for, for us to be held accountable. And I think those are things like Energy Star and Resby, which will help hold us accountable as an industry. So that's what I had, Varun and Kerry. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much, Akshay. You covered a lot of ground. It was very insightful. What was personally very interesting to me is, you know, there's so many of these new trends that have emerged and are driving things in the industry, which, which I was not very aware of. We have time for a few questions. So I encourage the audience to uh, put them in the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, but I'll, I have two, Akshay, and then Kerry, maybe, you know, you, you have some for Akshay. Uh, one of them is, we had a major blackout in the state uh, a few months ago. Uh, both of, you know, all three of us here <laughs> live in Austin, we faced uh, that. Uh, has that led to any differences in your observation of as how building owners or operators are looking at this and what has it meant for interactions with you and your operations? Yes. Uh, there were two, I think about seven, eight years ago on the East Coast, there was a massive blackout uh, that happened across much of that circuitry. And then of course the Texas blackout that we all remember. Uh, resilience is a massive, massive thing in the, in the real estate industry, already has been and is now. And that's where you start to also look at generation uh, as a way of more resilience as well, because just because there's a blackout and a lot of these buildings uh, especially buildings that are, you know, I would say really required buildings for just the operational aspects of, of our day-to-day -day life do have backup generators, but there was a lot of concern. And I think you're going to start to see owners start to hold the uh, generation companies and utilities and, and maybe even the jurisdictions more accountable for that risk, because that's a risk that they hadn't necessarily been, they had been aware of it, but they hadn't really thought that that was going to happen to that degree, especially as it happened in Texas. Um, so I think there's going to be more pressure uh, in terms of resiliency of the grid. But I think that owners are also going to say we need more resiliency in our portfolio and generation can be a part of that. And then just, uh, you know, more backup generation can also be a part of that. But I think it's we are hearing clients bring it up. The other thing that happened was there were massive spikes. And when you start to look at the operational impacts of a massive spike for your tenants or for your buildings, uh, that's a, it's very quick. And I know this, this may sound a little bit cynical to say, it's a very quick line between profitability and return and loss. And those types of things will be viewed very, very closely by, by the industry as we go forward. No, that's, that's very important to know, Akshay. And a related question just came up from Harold. 
who is asking about storage and what you're seeing in terms of storage on individual. Yeah. Uh, somewhat selfishly, I would love for this to take off because we have a microgrid product <laughs> that nobody has bought. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, and in fact, actually the University of Texas operates in a way that I think I would love to see all portfolios operate. You guys generate, right? So you, you, you are your own generation house. And in fact, Maroon, one of the things that when we first met, we talked about was you guys said, look, we want to slow the amount of generation that we're investing in. So how do we reduce the, uh, the demand and the underlying consumption of the, you know, the, the 40 acres? I think that these things that we call them microgrids, I, I'm assuming that most of the industry does as well, will start to become more prevalent. You're starting to see battery technology reduce in cost. We didn't even talk about the cost of things like you know, solar and wind. It is now so much cheaper to do a solar farm than it is to do a coal-fired plant. There's just no question at this point. And at some point, capitalism takes over. I think battery technology is starting to get there as well. And what I think will happen is, especially on these industrial, uh, and I'm speculating here, so this is not empirical, but uh, I think on these industrial portfolios, you'll see these massive rooftop solar uh, you know, farms. You will also see storage happening as a result of that. And where they're going to use that is in my mind, time of use, on-peak, off-peak. So they'll, they'll default to battery storage for on-peak and then they'll go to grid for off-peak. I think that's how you're gonna see it kind of uh, start to uh, manifest itself. But I, I think this is coming. Uh, whether it happens in the next five years, I don't know, I'd love for it to happen. Um, but it's not clear to me it will happen in the next five years, but I think you're gonna see it on the, watch the industrial sector. You know, Prologis is a company to look at. And you can see a lot of their uh, comps. There's a couple of other large REITs. See what they're doing. And I think you'll see the rest of the industry follow. Great. Here. I have one question uh, for one of the slides you mentioned. It's sort of your reduce, reuse, recycle slide, but you also have you know, storage. And I think it's talking just about greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide. Um, that's kind of I don't know, uh, fully technological end is you know, injecting CO2 in the ground. Do you hear? people in the real estate industry talking about whether they should invest in actual carbon storage projects as opposed to landscaping things and you know that kind of stuff is is, is that does that discussion occur for the embodied wow. emissions or any of these things you talk about i'm going to write that down because no i have not heard that uh and and i'm fortunate I, I, i've been able to speak with a lot of the the larger institutional investors have not heard that it does not mean it's not happening um but I think it's a great topic to bring up, which is how do you use the space around the building more appropriately uh, and more effectively, maybe not appropriately, but more effectively as, as it relates to your emissions goals. I think that's something that um, is going to be a conversation. I have not heard it personally, but what I do hear uh, is a lot of our clients are investing in sustainable solutions, whether it's data aggregation platforms uh, or whether it's actually construction. We are seeing more and more of uh, traditional real estate investors actually start to invest in things adjacent uh, to real estate, whether it's the platforms like ourselves. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, uh, investment in prop tech. And I think you're starting to see that kind of propagate itself into different applications of prop tech, of which this could be one of them. Great. We are almost out of time, but I'll ask a very important question because we have many students in the audience. So Akshay, if you could tell us very quickly what types of skills and career opportunities our students can have in this really important trend that is going on in your industry? Well, look, I, I graduated in 2002, uh, you know, from, uh, from, from the ECE school and, and uh, uh, Dr. Goodenough, who was the inventor of the lithium ion battery, right? So, I mean, I would say the University of Texas is at the forefront of this. And I think uh, there's all sorts of things. So obviously any engineering, uh, discipline, whether it's petroleum, electrical, or chemical engineering, or other uh, mechanical engineering. One of my best friends uh, who also went to UT was a mechanical engineering major. He is heavy into solar. Uh, he was one of, he was at Solyndra, he was at Sunrun. Uh, he now works at Applied Materials. I, th there's so much that, that, uh, that you all can do, and not just on necessarily the, the traditional engineering side, but on the policy side. And this is something Brun and I have talked about. Uh, you guys can start to help with that policy piece of how do you bring policymakers and, and investors together in a more collaborative way. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is 
the University of Texas is uniquely positioned for the new technologies, as well as some of the more traditional technologies in terms of oil and natural gas. And it takes in all of the above. It can't just be one or the other. And so I, I would say, maybe that's not the answer to your question, Varun, but almost anything you guys are studying will be applicable to this if, if you look at it. And it's going to become more and more important from a technology perspective, but also policymaking and decision-making at the sea level of all of these companies across the world. Great. Well, thank you so much, Akshay, for, for spending the time and really sharing your insights. Gary, do you want to close it off? Uh, no, I think that was great. So thank you very much for a very educational talk. We don't get to hear a lot about this industry, so it was good that you filled us in. I think there was a lot of good information. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, guys.